My name is James Kimbrell. Most people know me as Jimmy. I have been uh, teaching at FSU since 2000. I think the first poem I ever published, I was in the second grade and uh, we had a elementary school magazine, you know, that we all put together. And I remember writing it vaguely, but I think my mother may have had a hand in it <laughs> as well. Um, and then in high school, uh, I started writing. They were, they were mostly like, you know, the kind of poems you would write and give to a girl you had a crush on or something. But then um, there was an assignment. We had to either write an essay or write a poem in a style of a poet um, that we liked. So I'd written a poem in the style of Edgar Allan Poe and it wasn't about it wasn't a love poem. It was a poem in which I was expressing a kind of political anxiety. And I'd never written anything like that before. I'd never experienced that rush that I got when I wrote that poem. When I got to college, uh, there was a literary magazine called Stylus. And I read the poems in there and I, I thought they were just terrific. Of course, at this time I hadn't read much poetry, you know. Um, but I really wanted to get into that magazine. So, uh, you know, just that goal kept me writing poetry. I also wrote short fiction. And, and even though I was a philosophy major and I only took one creative writing course at all as an undergrad, it seemed like at the end of the semester, each semester, the thing I was most proud of was what I'd written you know, usually a poem or a story or something. After I got out of college, I was still thinking I was going to either go do graduate work in philosophy or go to law school. But during that time of sitting out, uh, this was an important time for me. Uh, I mean, the dumb jobs, the low paying jobs, you know, that's humiliating. Um, and uh, it really kind of forced me into taking an inventory of what was most important to me. And it kind of emboldened me in some ways to take a chance. And I think anytime we go into a creative pursuit with an eye towards committing our entire life to it, we take a risk. A risk that most people feel is foolish. Generally, if you're smart enough to do these sorts of things, you're probably smart enough to go get a law degree or to get a, an MBA or, or something that could actually make money for you. Um, of course, I'd been broke for so long, I didn't think, you know, it wasn't like something I was going to have to get used to. And so that didn't really scare me. The things that are normally there to scare you off didn't scare me. You know, it worked out. I started uh, publishing that year, that sit out year. I uh, had a few points picked up by big magazine and I applied to graduate school and um, I was admitted conditionally because my undergraduate degree wasn't in English. And I guess there are other reasons I don't know, but um, after I started publishing poems that uh, they lifted all that and gave me a TA on top of it, gave me a fellowship. And then um, I just never looked back, really. So it's very hard to make general rules about things that occur on a specific basis, to make broad statements about good and bad in poetry outside the context of an individual poem. But I will tell you generally that the poem that draw me in tend to be the ones that risk something. They risk making the poet look bad. They risk upsetting the reader. They risk, um, and they may do something with language that compromises accessibility and, and your ability to understand it right away. But that rings a bell in some other area is another kind of risk. Um, the risk of uh, cutting against the status quo of how poems are supposed to be done, in quotation marks. Um, that ability and that willingness to risk oneself, to make oneself vulnerable, um, 
and to do that very difficult thing with grace and formal elegance is something that um, just draws my attention. In my own writing, for instance, I write often about race. You know, I grew up in uh, Jackson, Mississippi, and I was in that first generation of students who went to integrated schools. And the way that worked out in Jackson was basically that most people who had enough money to move, moved. And so uh, I would say 98% of my classmates were African-American. And so, um, you know, subsequently, uh, a large majority of my closest friends, you know, uh, were African American. And so, and then my neighbors, everybody in the neighborhood. And so, well, how do I write about that? You know, um, also, usually I'm perceived as, you know, just a straight up, uh, Anglo-Saxon, upper middle class, because I'm educated or because of the way I speak. And uh, that's, that's just not the case. Um, I come from, you know, I have a, people from every continent in my family. Um, you know, I'm part Lebanese, part Portuguese, part, you know, the list goes on. And, uh, and I didn't grow up in the upper middle class. Uh, when I grew up, we didn't have a car or a TV or, you know, my dad uh, was a disabled veteran, so he couldn't work. And uh, he didn't get much money from the government because they had a very difficult time classifying his disability. So, you know, it was a, it was a less than uh, ideal situation. Having said that, you know, I couldn't really identify with say the working class either because I had, you know, great grandparents that had master's degrees and uh, were teachers and stuff, you know, and, and were prosperous, at least before the depression. And so I've never felt like I fit in with any group um, other than poets. I feel right at home with poets. There, there are times when you're writing and after you've sat there for a period, you know, three or four hours, however long you usually write, and you get up from it and you feel like, you feel kind of raw emotionally. Um, like the, the wires have been stripped a little bit. And, uh, but you feel like maybe some big stone that was holding down a lot of emotion has been moved. So it's a little bit painful, but it's also uh, ultimately liberating. I think oftentimes young poets in my workshop sometimes, you know, it takes them a while to actually get to their subject because their subject is absolutely horrifying. And it's gonna cost them emotionally to deal with it. Um, and, uh, in order to write the poem, they have to undergo a, a process of reflection. While some poems and stories kind of dance around the fire, I tend to favor those that sort of stand in the middle of the flame and just get burnt. There are two things that ideally will have a lot more to do with your education than any of the teachers you've had or any of the classes you've had even as these teachers and classes may sometimes stand in the way of your education. Um, and that's number one is reading. Um, not just poetry, but fiction, nonfiction. Just read voraciously and indiscriminately. Just read, read, read. I think that that voice that you hear in your mind when you're, read, when you're writing, is in some ways grown, is certainly fertilized by the voice that you hear in your mind when you're reading. And uh, so that's the first part, just read. Read as much as you can. Read a lot of contemporary poetry. Get you a good anthology, go through it cover to cover so that you're fluent. Nobody knows more about this stuff than you do. 
and then find out who are the poets from the 50s and the 30s and before who influenced them who were the poets who influenced them and then keep going back with it until you arrive at a more three-dimensional understanding of the history of the thing that it is that you're trying to do in this history it's not just information you get tools for how to make your own poems you see how other poets confronted the same dilemma that you're confronting and how they were able to resolve that dilemma or flesh the dilemma out at least in the context of their own poems. So that brings us to the second thing, which is writing. Just do as much of it as you can, uh, whether it's in your journal or on your poems particular. Um, just keep it interesting, keep yourself engaged. Sometimes, you know, uh, I guess that if there was a third leg to this, it would be revision. Um, revision, when I was in college, you know, process, the idea of process over product was becoming popular. And there was rarely a time when I submitted a paper that I didn't write it two or three times. But I had never really carried that over into my poetry until after I was in college, got out of college. I, I always thought, you know, this is how I would write in college. I would drink a lot of coffee. And then once I was totally amped up, I would write a poem. Usually it was all one sentence with no caps, right down the page. And then after I was done, I was done. So the poem was kind of the record of the moment of inspiration. Well, there was only so far I could take a poem. And after I got out of college and I was, you know, I had all this kind of time on my hands. I was like, well, what am I gonna do? I would just start looking at a poem that I had considered finished. And then I would put it next to one of my favorite poems by somebody else. And I would ask myself, is my poem as good as this one? And if not, why? And I would just keep working it and working it and working it, turning it over, rearranging the syntax, moving this part that had started the poem to the middle of the poem, moving the part that had ended the poem to the beginning of the poem, moving the middle of the poem to the end of, you know, shell gaming it until I found a combination that works in a way that I was convinced would be the best possible way. I, I have runs where I'll get up at a certain time of the day or have a certain time of the day to write. And I'll be consistent with that a month, two months, three months in a row. And of course, life interferes when you get out of your routine and you're out of the saddle. Now that I'm grown and I have four children and a full-time job, um, I write when I can. And I, uh, you know, I'm usually able to get a couple of hours, couple three hours. I have found that um, if we wait for the perfect time, we'll be waiting forever. So when I uh, took the job at Florida State, I had about 10 different flyouts to 10 different schools. So I had some other offers. Um, but uh, Florida State just felt like home to me. It felt very familiar. Um, you know, I'm from Mississippi and um, uh, North Florida, uh, the culture isn't that different, uh, but it is, it is, it has different influences here. Um, I didn't want to move back to Mississippi, uh, but I did want to be close. And um, of course, if you grow up in Mississippi, the idea of Florida is like paradise, right? Florida is the opposite of everything you don't like about Mississippi. Well, you grow up and you realize that's not true. That was obviously a childhood fantasy. But I think there may still be a little tinge of that Florida magic that I carry around, you know, like, oh, it's Florida. Everything's okay now. <laughs> but I got down here for the interview, and the thing that really clinched it for me was uh, the faculty in the English department. Um, David Kirby and Mark Weingartner and Virgil Suarez were all on the hiring committee. and. They were just, um, I don't know, I just felt much more comfortable with them than I did at any other place I interviewed. I liked the fact that we had an MFA program and a PhD program. And um, yeah, it was just, you know, for all those reasons, it was very appealing. The weather, of course, is nicer down here. But I also think that the majority of, a lot of my students here 
as opposed to when I was teaching at a private college. Um, I don't know, I identify with them a lot more. Uh, I think a lot of them are first generation college students. And, um, you know, I identify with that. My, my father uh, quit school in the eighth grade. Um, he got his GED in the Air Force. Um, my mother wasn't, my mother went to college uh, at the same time I did when she was an adult, you know. And so those circumstances produce a kind of drive and an ambition and a general lack of tolerance for BS uh, that I identify with and that feels like home to me. And um, it feels very natural for me to put whatever I can offer it in terms of teaching, in terms of career support behind this group of people here, behind my students here. I identify with them, I understand their situation, and I, and I know what it takes to, to move forward. Uh, and so I feel like I had more to offer the students here. The law of truly large numbers, it has an epigraph from Percy Diaconis and Frederick Mosteller, an essay they wrote called Methods for Studying Coincidences. And the quote is, with a large enough sample, any outrageous thing is likely to happen. And so what they're talking about is, for instance, if you have a, a study group of 100 and you see that an event occurs uh, 1% of the time, every once in 100, well, that's just one, that's a small group. But if that group is uh, 10 million and the same event occurs one in 100, that event occurs much more frequently. So um, this is uh, sort of the changing nature of things as we become a more populated planet. The most outrageous things are likely to happen, statistically speaking. So I call the poem the law of truly large numbers. This is how it goes. Earth is so heavy with people, my love. We've doubled our numbers since my arrival. You can still fit 20 humans into a Volkswagen Beetle, but I worry, will there be enough seat belts for our four children? What if civilization bottoms out backing down our driveway? Or you can populate two New York cities with people that share your birthday. Isn't that and that and that a coincidence? A miracle might strike at any moment. Everything rare is well done. Everyone compares their lottery winnings. So long religion, down the road, rabbit's foot. But even in a world of colossal, humongous, truly superb, blip-sized numbers, my love, we're exactly two people. And when we sleep, despite what my snoring might suggest, I am only one man. And of that night I proposed with Chablis and pawn shop diamond beneath the walnut tree, and you said yes, I'll say this. Quantity only betters the structure of affection, the architecture of surprise. As when you step from the shower and, and search for your towel, even though I've hidden it for the millionth time, so that I might behold you searching for your towel until finally you ask, hey, have you seen my towel? At which point I jump to the rescue with dry, fluffy, wondrous towels worthy of Nefertiti. And the whole morning smells like sweet pea and violet body wash lavender and citrus anti-frizz conditioner. And this is only the first hour of the day. I'm one timeline away from figuring out when the odds kicked in, how I found you. It's so crowded, my love, and we've all been mistaken for someone else with the same first name and a one digit difference in our social security numbers. If only we could hold a truly large mirror up to earth, we could at least gain the illusion of spaciousness this would also solve the problem of surveillance. Everybody making love outside, looking up at themselves, making love in the sky.